In this series of videos, we will embark on a journey where we will delve into the world of analog computing. We'll step into the boots of our ancestors and pace ourselves through their ways of computation. Our analog predecessors may look at us proudly as we venture out to the past. Or they might say, why the hell are you messing with this old crap? To begin, we must distinguish between analog and digital signals. My voice is actually a good depiction of an analog signal. That is because it uses a natural phenomenon known as pressure gradients in the air, or how normal people understand it as sound. All physical phenomena, like my voice, can be viewed as a continuous signal. One major drawback is when feeding analog signals through electrical components or wires, electrical noise naturally attaches itself to the analog signal, causing the signal to be hard to read. Using that fact, I will read my social security number out loud. 5 1 8 after spending a few months trying to get my identity back and figuring out why that last bit didn't work, I realized that the analog information from my microphone is being converted into a digital signal and being sent to you digitally, and then being converted back into an analog signal so you could hear my bad jokes through your speaker. The reason why this method is preferred is because the digital signals are very tolerant to noise due to their binary nature. It's very easy to distinguish between 1 and 0 instead of 0 0.665 and 0 0.668. You don't want to get mixed signals because that may be a trap. It is the binary over the continuous data type that is preferred in sending information. But what does that have to do with computation? Nowadays, all computers are digital computers, meaning they use binary and small logic gates. And, NAND, or, and so on to perform calculations. What makes digital computers useful is that they don't have one specific purpose. They are designed to be programmed to perform any desired task. However, this comes with the drawback of the complex algorithms necessary to perform such a task. This not only takes time to design, but also takes time to compute. Nowadays, you don't really notice computational lag too often unless you're trying to run Crisis 3 on full settings. This is where analog computing steals the spotlight. Analog computing is fast and accurate, but not precise. While it can be precise if there is extra precaution when designing the analog computer. What makes it special is that we send some continuous input, such as AC voltage, and force the signal through natural occurring operations through other electrical components. So instead of designing a digital circuit or writing a script to calculate the derivative of a sine wave, we can send a sinusoidal voltage input through a capacitor in an op amp to perform the calculation. That is because the charging of the capacitor is naturally dependent on the mathematical operation known as the derivative. Essentially, we just have to connect some wires together and let nature do its thing. What you're looking at right now is an op amp differentiator. Now this is not your typical op amp differentiator, meaning it's not the ideal circuit one. This is called the practical op amp differentiator. And this took me a while to configure correctly because there's a lot of things are going on with this circuit. Well, it's not too much, but it's somewhat complicated. Initially, I had the ideal circuit, which was just a resistor and capacitor with an op amp. And I thought the issue was that my gain was too large, meaning the output was getting saturated. However, that wasn't the issue. I found out that the op amp differentiator, the ideal circuit that you typically learn in class or in a textbook, is very unstable. So what you have to do is actually add these resistor and this capacitor in the negative and positive feedback loops, which creates this stability for this op amp to work properly. However, with this circuit, it is frequency dependent. So basically, this is our input right here, and this is going to be our output over here. And depending on the frequency of the signal, it will the circuit will act differently. It will act like a differentiator or it will act like an inverting amplifier. So there is this cutoff frequency which is dependent on the resistor and capacitor values that says if you go above this frequency, it will start acting like an inverting op amp. However, if you're below this frequency, it will start acting like a differentiator. And I'll show you that in practice. On the oscilloscope, this shows the inputs and outputs of the practical op amp differentiator that was shown previously. The input is some sinusoidal input, so we can say it's just the sine function. And the derivative of the sine function is just cosine. However, when it comes to op amps, usually the gain is inverted. Therefore, the output is also inverted. So technically, the input is sine and the output is negative cosine. And to confirm with the oscilloscope, I have this Desmos application, this web application, which graphs out the sine wave and the negative cosine wave, and it looks fairly similar. 
As you can see, the signals are not necessarily the same in terms of amplitude. That comes down to the actual capacitor values and resistor values because they're not me necessarily made to the correct value, meaning there's some sort of tolerance when it comes to those electrical components. And I believe the frequency is also dependent on the gain. So if the frequency increases, it acts more like an inverting op amp. However, as the frequency goes towards the differentiating range of the circuit, adds a little bit of amplitude to the output. Or actually it decreases the amplitude to the output because it's inversely proportional to it. So I believe that's why the amplitude is not necessarily the same when it comes through the input and the output. Just like digital computing, analog computers have their disadvantages. For instance, they cannot be generalized to do unrelated tasks, meaning you will have to rearrange the entire circuit to perform a different task. Another disadvantage is that you cannot easily store analog information due to that constantly changing signal. Again, if you were to save an analog signal, the analog signal would then just be converted into a matrix of ones and zeros and stored that way instead. A planimeter is a prime example of an analog device. Essentially, the planimeter measures the area of closed regions. You could take any arbitrary closed region and the planimeter will calculate its area. How it works is based on Green's theorem that you may vaguely remember. But basically, it relates a line integral to the area of the closed region. More importantly, you can view Green's theorem as a physical phenomenon or something readily given by nature, and you can view that analog signal as the arm that continuously traces around the shape. The device then takes that analog signal and outputs it on some sort of measurement display almost instantaneously. So now that we have a good understanding of digital and analog computers, you can probably see why I am building an analog computer instead of a digital computer. It's because it's easier for me, and I think it'll be more entertaining. If I built a digital computer, then it will not feel any different than me showing some complicated program that solves differential equations. Rather, I think it'll be more exciting to see nature, so to speak, to do the calculation for me. This will allow us to step into the past to see how old school control engineers solve differential equations by twisting a few knobs here and there. In the next video, I'll go over the theory behind second order differential equations and see how they can be solved by using an analog computer. With that being said, I'll see you next time.